modern 3D printers use modern networking concepts. Today, we are going to explore cloud-connected 3D printing and why in some ways that can be convenient, but also why there's some areas you should really be concerned about. As mainstream 3D printing gradually shifts from its RepRap origins through to a more corporate appliance-based product, we have the introduction of new opportunities, but also new threats. Today, we explore these as they relate to cloud connectivity. And we start by determining how the term cloud fits in in a 3D printing context. Let's say that we've bought a typical 3D printer, we've built it and we're ready to use it and get 3D printing. It's unlikely that this is the only piece of electronics in your house, but as it stands, the majority of 3D printers have no way of communicating with your existing smart devices. A common solution is to add a Raspberry Pi to the 3D printer, perhaps with host software such as Octoprint or perhaps a firmware change to Clipper. This will allow your 3D printer to connect to your local network through your router. And since other devices like computers and phones also connect in this way, you can use these devices to talk directly to the 3D printer, controlling its movements, starting and stopping print jobs, and monitoring a webcam feed. It's all very convenient. The thing about this connectivity is that it all happens within your local network. That is to say, your devices are talking directly to each other, and the communication never leaves your local router. So how does this differ to a cloud-connected 3D printer? Well, firstly, there's onboard Wi-Fi in these 3D printers, so without any additional hardware, they can connect to your Wi-Fi through your local router. But communication also takes place with servers outside your local network, nicknamed the cloud. They're obviously not up in the sky, but instead located all around the world and help make up the communication that is the internet. The important distinction here is that they're outside our local network. As you're watching this video, your device through your router is connecting to a YouTube server in the cloud to stream back the video and audio. And in the case of our 3D printing, the result is similar. Bamboo Lab and other manufacturers have their own servers in the cloud, and these are involved in the communication between your device and your 3D printer, despite your 3D printer and other devices all being on your local network. And this may seem needlessly complex, but utilizing the cloud does bring us some nice advantages. If you remember back with our Octoprint example, where we were controlling the printer from our mobile in the house, well, what happens if we leave the house? By default, since we're not on our local network, we'll lose connection and be isolated from the printer. And we can do some custom networking, such as installing VPN software on both our router and our phone. But as this guide says, there's no guarantees for getting it right and there's many different options to choose from. In fact, Octoprint now has a curated list of plugins that will make remote access a lot easier, but it's still an extra step for the user to undertake. Our first advantage of a cloud-connected 3D printer is that once you've connected your companion app to the printer and got the printer on your Wi-Fi network, you'll be able to take your mobile device outside of the house, and as long as you have a mobile data connection, you'll be able to monitor the printer as if you were sitting at home, and that includes all of the controls and settings too. And that's because of that cloud integration. All of the networking is done for you and built into the mobile app. The whole setup is really rather convenient. But it doesn't stop there. Recently, I made this little nozzle holder to assist me in positioning the nozzle down into a bracket where my fingers just can't reach. Let's say I'm away from home and I inexplicably drop it down the car and lose it forever. In the Bamboo Lab ecosystem, every print job you've ever sent to a machine is listed under your history with the G-code saved, so remotely from your phone, you can start the print once more. As long as you know the print bed is empty and filament is loaded up, you can start prints from anywhere in the world where you have internet connection. And of course, you can then switch to a camera view to make sure that the print has started. It's pretty satisfying to arrive back to the printer and see the part waiting for you that you started remotely from the cloud. Another smart feature that uses the cloud is spaghetti detection. This is built into Bamboo Lab printers as well as the M5 from AnchorMake. In the AnchorMake version, when the model is sliced, images are saved for each layer from the point of view of the onboard camera. And then during printing, the images from the camera are compared to this, and if they look significantly different for five or more layers, then the error is triggered. This demanding machine learning processing doesn't take place on the printer, instead it takes place on cloud servers. 
freeing up the printer's MCU for focusing on just printing until it receives a notification from the cloud that something might have gone wrong. A variation on this has been introduced in recent Bamboo Lab firmware updates, where the user, with a convenient ticker box interface, can supply feedback on print quality to the cloud servers. When you sent your print job from the slicer to the machine, the cloud servers already retained a copy of the G-code, so coupled with the user feedback, remote analysis can take place to look for trends that might improve slicer profiles. For instance, the feedback might suggest that prints are less likely to fail if users are using a slightly lower max volumetric speed, so the inbuilt profiles are altered to lower this slightly and make prints more reliable for everyone. Our next potential benefit is something we've seen in the past, such as on the BQ Thunder, but not necessarily recently and that is direct integration with online file repositories such as My Manufactory, Thingiverse, and Printables. The BQ Thunder would let you browse the website from their app, select your filament, and then slice the file in the cloud before sending the G-code down to the 3D printer. Part of the compromise here was that to make it reliable, every print had to have support material turned on, even if user experience dictated that it wasn't needed for that particular model. The most recent printer I've tried with this functionality was the Creality CR10 Smart. But the system was anything but, because it was locked to Creality Cloud instead of something like Thingiverse or Printables. One improvement was you had a lot more control over the slicer settings, making it much more viable to start a print job remotely, but ultimately the implementation still wasn't very good because that particular printer had some severe hardware limitations. The trick with this concept is being able to tie into a worthwhile online repository. So perhaps printables owned by Prusa will be utilized in a future Prusa machine. Finally, one straightforward but very worthwhile benefit of cloud connectivity is being able to download and update firmware directly from the printer, which is so much more user-friendly than what's existed in the past. Hopefully you agree based on what we've just discussed that there are some worthwhile advantages to cloud connected 3D printing. But now onto the negatives. And as you're about to see, there's some pretty big issues we need to look out for. So we already know that cloud servers are involved in communication with the printer, but you might not know that currently, every time you upload a file from the slicer to the printer, it doesn't happen on your local network. Instead, the file goes to your router, out to the cloud, is processed and then sent back to your router and then to the 3D printer. Most of the time, this convoluted workflow is still pretty seamless. But what happens if the cloud server goes offline? Or perhaps the server's good, but you lose access to external internet for any other reason. It really is game over. That's because the communication between your device and your printer will be severed. And even though they're both connected to the same local network, communication between them will be impossible. That's inconvenient in the short term, but what about servers going dark in the long term? Gamers will understand the consequence of this because it happens quite often. Either a game gets too old and multiplayer is no longer available, or perhaps the entire developer goes bust, shutting down their servers. In these cases, these games are crippled because they can't be played online anymore. And we have that same potential with our cloud-connected 3D printers. If they rely too much on the cloud, they will be essentially bricked as soon as the cloud isn't available. For this reason, I would never purchase a printer that didn't have a backup method of printing from either a USB flash drive or an SD card. If it's cloud printing only, I would say no go. Fortunately so far, of the cloud connected printers that I've tested, this hasn't been an issue and a backup has been provided. It's time now to talk about privacy, and perhaps most of us are getting a little desensitized to how much data companies like to collect from us. For example, let's take Threads, a new app launched by Meta, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram. As far as I know, it's designed to compete with Twitter. So you'd think it wouldn't need to know that much about you, but if we look at the app privacy details, the list of data that it's collecting from the user is ridiculously long. This app is going to collect info about where you live, the places you go, all of your contacts, go through your user photos and videos, your search and browsing history, the things you like to buy, and sensitive info, whatever that is. Fortunately, we don't need to worry too much about this stuff with 3D printing yet, but you never know what's around the corner. I would personally be very wary about the information I shared when signing up for any cloud-connected 3D printing services. And I'm sure the comments will let me know if it's a better idea to handle it with a third party like Google. Cloud servers are unfortunately compromised quite often. Even if I focus on just Australian companies, 
Over the last few years, the amount of private data that's been leaked is ridiculous. But breaches aside, sometimes the 3D printing companies handle things poorly themselves. In my Anchormake M5 review, I link to a Linus Tech Tips video explaining that Eufy, a subsidiary of Anchor, had devices uploading footage from security devices to unsecured cloud servers. So if your 3D printer comes with a camera, consider pointing it away from anything important. You never know who will end up with access to these images. Let's quickly revisit that idea of a malicious actor entering the system. If they bypass the security in the 3D printer, then they potentially have a backdoor to your local network through your router. That's why, as well as changing the default password for your 3D printing specific components, you should always change the default username and password for your router as well. Your local network is only as strong as your weakest link. So don't let compromised 3D printer security be the ticket in to the rest of your precious devices. This next potential threat was the genesis of the whole video and was sent in by viewer Kenton. And it's to do with the fact that when you upload your print file, it doesn't go directly to the printer, but goes to the cloud where a copy is stored. Kenton proposed that intellectual property, specifically 3D product designs, could be stolen by a government or other third party as they went through the cloud. Basically, that the geometry for product ideas could go straight to the copycats and be produced and sold without the consent or involvement of the original designer. And I replied that on paper, I agree that this is possible, but in practice, quite unlikely. Firstly, because of the amount of human resources required. There would be many thousands of models being uploaded for printing every day, and I don't think AI would be effective at assessing these. Therefore, you would need rooms full of people sifting through the many 3D files, trying to find something worthwhile. And judging what is worthwhile is extremely difficult as well. For instance, here's one component from a torch design I featured recently. Unless it's in the title, you probably wouldn't know this was a torch, and you'd be hard pressed to work out how this design functioned. For instance, no one would have any way of knowing that magnets sit in each of the legs. They might guess that cells sit as a power source in these cutouts, but I don't think they'd be able to tell what went down in this lower trench. So even if it was determined that this object was worth stealing, there'd be too much guesswork in determining what other hardware needed to be included and in how the whole thing went together. Perhaps more decorative designs would be easier to steal, but I think companies are already pretty good at pumping out clone toys without involving 3D printers in the process. Kenton also told me about the next topic, which is introduced in this review video for the Creality K1 from the 3D Printing Zone channel and that is invasive advertising. If an app is required to operate a 3D printer, then there's nothing to stop the company, in this case Creality, from flooding it with ads and annoying notifications. I updated and opened the Creality app, and sure enough, it didn't take long to find ads for annoying mobile games and dodgy shopping sites. Fortunately, I'm not relying on this app to use any of my 3D printers, but I'd be quite upset if I was. This Creality app is also a segue to our last threat, Trojan Horse subscription models. For those who purchased a K1 and will be relying on this app, I bet they weren't expecting to be encouraged to pay a subscription model for premium service. This has all the hallmarks of a freemium mobile phone game littered with ads and encouraging people to pay real money to unlock things that should just work. Recently car manufacturers have been guilty of doing the same thing, keeping certain features behind a subscription paywall. And I guess this is now going to be a threat for any product with cloud connectivity. As far as I know, Creality is the only 3D printer manufacturer currently doing this, and I hope there's a lot of backlash so they're also the last. Thanks again to Kenton for spiking the idea that formed the video, and also to my patrons David and Zeke for discussing the concept and helping flesh it out. I think I can predict the responses, but maybe there's something I've missed, but please post in the comments whether or not you welcome cloud-connected 3D printing, and tell me what aspects you are most wary of. It will be interesting to see how this video ages, whether it was much fuss about nothing, or whether typical cloud-connected trends taint our hobby. Personally, I feel that we should hope for the best, but also prepare for the worst just in case. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy convenient but safe 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.